A very good evening, friends. I welcome you all to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by the Shankar AIS Academy. A kind request to you all. For those who haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, please subscribe and hit the bell icon so that you will get regular updates regarding our current affairs video. And also, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe the video. Before getting into discussion, I have an important announcement to you. It's regarding the much awaited pre-storming test series. Batch 2 of the test series is to about to begin on 15th of October and the first test will be conducted on 22nd October. A total of 48 tests including mock and CSAT will be provided with it and the test series will be conducted in both online and offline mode. So go and register for the test series and boost your prelim score. With this happy announcement, let us get into our discussion. Today's date is 7th October 2023. Here are the list of the news articles which we are going to discuss today. So, without much delay, let us get into the news discussion. Look at this news article. Yesterday, the Supreme Court said that it will constitute a seven judge bench to hear the issues relating to money bills. See, several analysts have raised a concern about an issue which can seriously affect the accountability of the executives to the legislatures. So what is the issue? The issue is the central government has recently introduced several legislations like other bills in the name of money bills. I hope we are all aware of the fact that the money bills can be introduced only in Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha cannot even amend or reject it. So several political analysts are concerned about the current government that it is creating several legislatures in the name of money bill to just bypass the scrutiny of Rajya Sabha. Remember, the current government is not having a majority in the Rajya Sabha. So, because of this concern, several eminent peoples have filed petitions before the Supreme Court. Thereby, the Supreme Court announced that it will constitute a seven-judge bench to hear the petitions relating to money bills. This is all about the news. So, this issue of circumventing the accountability of legislatures is often asked in the mains examinations and prelims examinations. So, in this discussion, let us understand some points about money bill. First of all, know that the Article 110 of the Indian Constitution deals with the money bills. So, the class 1 of the Article 110 lists out several matters like taxation, regulation of the government borrowing, custody of Consolidated Fund of India and so on. So, if any of the bill deals with the matters which were listed now, then such bill is termed as the money bill. So, now I am putting it in a technical way that money bill is a bill that deals with the taxation, government's borrowing and other matters as mentioned in Article 110, Class 1. Now, we will look at the futures of the money bill from exam perspective. See, first point is money bill can be introduced only in Lok Sabha. Second point is money bill can be introduced only by a minister of the central government and not by any other members of the parliament as in the case of other bills. Third point is money bill can be introduced only after the prior recommendation of the president. Now continuing our discussion, we know that in case of money bill, Rajya Sabha has limited powers. Once Lok Sabha passes the bill, it will be sent to Rajya Sabha for recommendations. See the word only recommendations. It means Rajya Sabha cannot reject or amend the money bill. However, it can make recommendations and send the bill back to Lok Sabha. But there is also a catch. Here, the bill should be sent within 14 days from the date of receiving of the bill from Lok Sabha. See, once the Lok Sabha gets back the bill from Rajya Sabha, the following options are available before it. They are Lok Sabha can either consider the recommendations or reject the recommendations. This means that in case of money bill, Rajya Sabha's recommendations are not binding on the Lok Sabha. So, if Lok Sabha accepts or rejects the recommendation, the bill is deemed to be passed by the parliament and it will be sent to obtain president's assent. We should be also aware of the fact that if Rajya Sabha does not act on the money bill within 14 days, then also the bill is deemed to be passed by the parliament. So, from these basic facts, we can observe a thing that the role of Rajya Sabha is very limited with respect to money bills. 
Now coming to President's assent. See, once the President receives the money bill after being passed by Parliament, he can either accept the bill or withhold his assent. But the President cannot return the bill for the reconsideration of the Parliament. What does it mean? It means no suspensive veto is available with respect to money bills. But generally the Presidents give his assent to the money bill as it was introduced with his prior approval. Finally, let us note one important fact. See, if any question arises whether a bill is money bill or a normal bill, the decision of the Lok Sabha Speaker shall deem to be final. This means it is up to the Speaker to decide whether a particular bill is money bill or not. But Supreme Court in Aadhaar case ruled that the decision of the Speaker to classify a bill as money bill or not is under the preview of judicial review. It means the Supreme Court has opened the gates of scrutiny for the Speaker's decision. This is all about the discussion regarding money bill. I hope we have discussed all the facts related to money bill. So revise it often as this topic is very important from our exam perspective. Having learned these basic points, let us take up the next article for discussion. Look at this news article. Yesterday, the Monetary Policy Committee of the Reserve Bank of India has conducted a meeting. See, in this meeting, the committee has decided to keep the policy repo rate unchanged at 6.5%. See, this is the fourth consecutive time the committee has decided to maintain the repo rate at 6.5%. In addition to this, the MPC has also given two important macroeconomic indicators. First one, it retained the real GDP growth forecast at 6.5% for the financial year 2023 and 24. Moreover, the committee has also estimated that the average CPA inflation for the current fiscal year would be 5.4%. In this meeting, the RBI governor observed that the high inflation is a major risk to the macroeconomic stability of the country and it also affects the sustainable growth of the country. So, he said that the monetary policy of the RBI will continuously focus on aligning the inflation target at 4% on a sustainable durable basis. So, this is all about the news article. In this discussion, let us understand some basic points about the inflation and monetary policy committee. See, these two topics fall under the macroeconomic topic of the syllabus. So, now, let us start with the inflation. The term inflation refers to the general increase in the prices of goods and services in a country. Generally, the inflation is caused due to excessive money supply in the economy or it may be due to the increased demand for a particular goods. That is, too many money searching too many goods. See, if the people have excess money, they tend to spend more. It may increase the demand and the prices of the goods. This is the basis of inflation. The inflation and the associated problems are the major concerns for any country. So, to control the inflation, RBA uses various monetary tools like repo rate, reverse repo rate, CRR, SLR and so on. Using this monetary policy tools, RBA controls the money supply in the economy and thereby controlling the inflation in the economy. So, to decide on the policy rate of the monetary tools, RBA had an institutional framework called Monetary Policy Committee. So, let us see some more points about Monetary Policy Committee. Monetary Policy Committee or MPC was constituted by the central government under RBI Act 1934. Here, MPC is basically a committee of the RBA. See, it is responsible for deciding the benchmark policy rates like repo rate, reverse repo rate and so on. Note that the MPC is assisted by RBI's Monetary Policy Department in carrying these functions. Now, let us see about the composition of MPC. See, MPC is a six-member body. Out of this six members, three members will come from RBI and remaining three members will come from central government. The members from the RBI side includes RBI Governor, Deputy Governor who is in charge of monetary policy and an official nominated by RBI board. Then the other three members from the government side is up appointed by the central government. See, this appointment is based on the recommendation of the Search Come Selection Committee. Now, let us see the composition of the Search Come Selection Committee. Here, it consists of the Cabinet Secretary, the RBA Governor, 
the secretary of the department of economic affairs and three other experts who are ex experts in the field of economics or banking so this is all about the composition of mpc now let us see the main functions of the mpc see the main function is to maintain price stability and achieve inflation targets which are set by the central government so the primary goal of the committee is to maintain the inflation target at 4 percentage here a threshold is also given that is plus or minus 2 percentage that it means it can go up to maximum of 6 percentage or it can come up to 2 percentage here note that the decisions in mpc are usually taken based on the majority vote see if there is a tie the rbi governor will have a casting vote so at some times the vote of the rbi governor will be the deciding factors also note that the recommendation of the mpc are binding on the reserve bank of india so the rbi has to implement the recommendations of the mpc that is all about the basics of inflation and mpc so in this discussion we saw about inflation and the tools which are available to fight inflation and we also saw an important organization called monetary policy committee so with this learned points let us take up the next article look at this editorial article this article talks about the gst tax collection while the gst revenues have shown an overall growth there are also signs of slowdown in recent times so to address this there should be a careful monitoring and investigation which should be done by gst council this article gives us some data about gst collection gst revenues has slowed down to 10.2 percentage last month why this is important means this is the lowest revenue collections since july 2021 and moreover the growth from domestic transaction and service imports has also slowed down in recent months revenue from goods imports have decreased to four times this year despite a significant increase in the imports in the month of august so these are all the current trends in the economy as being given in the article now before getting into discussion let us look at the syllabus in prelims this topic will come under economic and social development sustainable development poverty inclusion demographics and social sector initiatives and in the mains part it comes under gs paper 3 under the topic of indian economy and issues related to planning mobilization growth development and employment this is all about the syllabus now before getting into discussion let us look at the question the question is goods and service tax was acclaimed as the watershed move in india's indirect tax reforms since independence in this context explain the performance of gst over the past 6 years here the key word is examine the word examine means we have to inspect positives and negatives of the topic in this answer we have to say what are the benefits or achievements of implementing the gst then we must also write some points about the drawbacks of gst now coming into the structure of the answer the statement in the question says goods and service tax is considered as a watershed move in india's indirect tax reforms so in introduction part we have to write some basic information about gst see if you are having any data or report regarding the gst you are welcome to use that in your introduction part now coming on to the main body of the answer it the main body can be split into two parts the first part should contain the success of implementing the gst and the second part should talk about the drawbacks of implementing it finally in the conclusion part you can give a balanced view of the gst now this is how we have to approach this question now let us start with the introduction see here the question is about gst as we have seen earlier in the introduction we can write some basic points about gst see we can write like this like gst is a destination based value added tax that was introduced in 2017 and moreover it was aimed to streamline the indirect tax structure and ultimately create one nation one tax and one market in india this is how you can give a very simple definition in introduction you can also add some points like gst has replaced the previous complex tax regime why it is complex means it comprises of 17 different taxes and surcharges such as sales tax vat service tax etc this is how you can give a crisp definition to your answer now coming to the body part of the answer see in first part you should write some positive aspects of the gst 
so put a simple subhead like positive aspects of gst under this we shall explain the achievements of gst one by one since this is a 10 marker four or five solid point is enough to answer firstly gst simplified the tax structure gst has replaced many indirect tax and united them under common roof for example taxes like vat sales tax luxury tax entertainment entry tax and assessment tax have been all brought under gst so this has ultimately reduced the compliance burden for the businesses and it facilitated the interstate trade secondly gst has increased the revenue collection of the state looking to this the gst boosted revenue collection through a broader tax base and and a better compliance system for example if you take the data the total gross revenue collection in the first half of the financial year 24 that is this financial year it stands at 9.92 lakh crores this is a 11% growth compared to the previous year and moreover if you look at the average monthly gross collection for the first half of the financial year it stands at 1.65 lakh crores this is also a 11% higher than the average monthly gross collection for 2022-23 thirdly GST has increased the tax returns. This means that more businesses and individuals are filing their GST returns with the tax authorities. As GST aims to bring more businesses under the tax net, it ultimately widened the tax base and it naturally led to increased tax returns. And moreover, stricter implementation of the GST regulations including the increased penalty for non-compliance can encourage more businesses to file their returns to avoid any legal consequences fourthly gst has helped the formalization of economy as we saw the tax base has expanded rapidly after the implementation of the gst 6.6 lakh new agents previously who were outside the tax net have been brought under gst regime also the implementation of the e-way bill system has helped to simplify the transportation of the products across the various states of india fifthly GST has reduced the regional disparity in tax collection. GST introduced uniform tax rate across various states and UTs, promoting price transparency and reduced regional disparities. Sixthly, the establishment of the GST Council represents the spirit of cooperative federalism. Here, both central and state governments can come together and take action on key policy decisions. For example, the rationalization of the tax rate on several items have over the years been updated taking suggestions from various states lastly digital transformation the gst regime encouraged digital transactions and improved tax administration through gstn that is goods and service tax network this technological upgrade reduced the tax evasion and simplified the tax filing processes so these are the major advantages of the gst regime Now coming to second part of our answer here we shall explain what are the challenges in the GST regime the first is complexity despite the GST aims to simplify the tax structure GST remains complex this is due to multiple tax slabs in the GST system for example various products have various taxes like 5% 12% 18% and 28% frequent change in the tax rates and the procedures have created a alternative set of complexity in the gst structure second important challenge is it is a big challenge for small businesses small and medium sized enterprises faced initial difficulties in adapting to the new system the compliance requirements and the need for digital infrastructure posed a serious threat for them third important challenge is anti profiteering issue there were concerns that businesses are not passing the benefits of reduced tax on to the customers so the government has formed national anti profiteering authority to address these issues fourth challenge is inverted duty structure here inverted duty structure simply means the tax rate on inputs like raw materials components are higher than the tax which are imposed on finished products so certain industries such as textiles and manufacturing face an idt which affects the competitiveness of these industries fifth important issue is the fuels are not yet brought under the gst petrol and diesel were kept out of the gst ambit leading to the complex tax rate for these essential commodities this exclusion has resulted in 
differential fuel prices across states and there are various challenges in managing this fuel tax policies. Last important challenge is revenue shortfall. While the GST was expected to significantly boost the revenue of the government, there have been periods of revenue shortfall which are seriously impacting the governmental finances. This news article that we have seen also supporting this argument. So these are the important challenges associated with GST. Now we have explained the benefits and challenges of GST in our body part of the answer. So having completed the body part, let us see the conclusion of the answer. See, I have already told you that we have to give a balanced conclusion to our answer. So the conclusion can be like this. The GST has undoubtedly brought a significant change in India's indirect tax system. But it also faced challenges related to issues like complexity, compliance and the impact on small businesses. So overall GST has been a significant step towards a more efficient and integrated Indian economy. But it requires continuous evaluation and refinement to achieve the full potential of GST and our economy. So this is all about the discussion. So with this learned points, let us take up the next news article. Look at this news article. Yesterday, our Home Minister Amit Shah chaired a meeting to review the security situation in left-wing extremism affected states. In this meeting, he announced that the left-wing extremism will be totally eliminated from the country in two years. Further, he also stressed the need for consistent surveillance in the areas which are already freed from left-wing extremism so that the problem will not happen again. So this is the crux of the article. In this discussion, let us understand the genesis of left-wing extremism and some of the efforts taken by the government to address this issue. First of all, let us see about left-wing extremism. See, left-wing extremism is a form of armed insurgency against the state. They are motivated by the leftist ideologies. The core aim of the extremists is that they reject the parliamentary democracy and aimed at waging an armed revolution against the government. But while saying this, we should not also neglect the fact that the main reasons behind the hatred towards the government is because of several factors. They are poor governance, lack of development in the tribal belt, an oppressive activity of the state and society in general. It had pushed the tribal population, the landless peoples, to the margins of survival. As the old saying goes, underdevelopment and extremism are the two sides of the same coin. Having seen this, let us see about the genesis of the problem and the ideologies of the left-wing extremists. The left-wing extremism or Naxal insurgency in India originated in the year of 1967 as an uprising in Naxalbari village in West Bengal by the Communist Party of India Marxist. See, they are group of people who believe in the political theory derived from the teachings of Chinese political leader Mao Zedong. The Naxals strongly believe that the solution to socio-economic discrimination is to overthrow the existing political system. So with this basics, let us see the states which are getting affected by left-wing extremism. See, the districts which are affected by this issue are demarcated by the union government as red zones. Nearly 90 districts in 11 states are considered to be affected by this left-wing extremism. Since these regions are in the central, eastern and southern part of India, they are almost called as red corridors. But with the continuous action of the state, coupled with the developmental activities, reduced the left-wing extremism problem in India. And currently, there has been a decline of more than 52% in left-wing extremism related violence and there is a reduction of more than 69% in deaths and 72% in security force personal death. And there has been a reduction of 68% in civilian deaths and all these data are between the years of 2014 to 23. Now moving on our discussion, let us talk about the steps taken by government to tackle this issue. Firstly, Home Ministry came up with a strategy of Samadhan to tackle this issue. It is a strategy to frame short term and long term policies. You can see here, displayed here is the expansion of Samadhan. See, I am giving you a brief on this and you can use this while writing answer on internal security. Here, S stands for Smart Leadership. 
ஏ ஸ்டாண்ட்ஸ் ஃபார் அக்ரெசிவ் ஸ்ட்ராட்டஜி எம் ஸ்டாண்ட்ஸ் ஃபார் மோட்டிவேஷன் அண்ட் ட்ரைனிங் ஏ ஸ்டாண்ட்ஸ் ஃபார் ஆக்ஷனபிள் இன்டெலிஜென்ஸ் டி ஸ்டாண்ட்ஸ் ஃபார் டேஷ்போர்ட் பேஸ்டு கேபிஐ ஹியர் கேபிஐ மீன்ஸ் கீ பெர்ஃபார்மன்ஸ் இண்டிகேட்டர்ஸ் ஃபார் சிஏபிஎஃப் அண்ட் ஸ்டேட் போலீஸ் பர்சனல்ஸ் அண்ட் ஹச் ஸ்டாண்ட்ஸ் ஃபார் ஹானசிங் த டெக்னாலஜிக்கல் அட்வான்ஸ்மெண்ட்ஸ் ஏ ஸ்டாண்ட்ஸ் ஃபார் ஆக்ஷன் பிளான் ஃபார் ஈச் தியேட்டர் ஹியர் வி ஷுட் நோ தட் த சுச்சுவேஷன் ஆஃப் லெஃப்ட் விங் எக்ஸ்ட்ரீமிசம் இஸ் டிஃப்ரெண்ட் இன் டிஃப்ரெண்ட் ஸ்டேட்ஸ் ஸோ ஈச் ஸ்டேட்ஸ் வில் டிமாண்ட் அ யூனிக் ஸ்ட்ராட்டஜி அண்ட் லாஸ்ட்லி என் ஸ்டாண்ட்ஸ் ஃபார் நோ அக்சஸ் டு ஃபினான்சிங் ஃபார் லெஃப்ட் விங் எக்ஸ்ட்ரீமிசம் குரூப்ஸ் தீஸ் ஆர் த எயிட் பில்லர்ஸ் ஆஃப் ஃபைட்டிங் த எக்ஸ்ட்ரீமிசம் ஹியர் த செகண்ட் பாயிண்ட் இஸ் த ஸ்கீம் த சமாதான ஸ்கீம் ஃபோக்கஸஸ் ஆன் ஸ்ட்ரென்தனிங் த போலீஸ் இன்ஃப்ராஸ்ட்ரக்சர் பை கன்ஸ்ட்ரக்ஷிங் செக்யூர் போலீஸ் ஸ்டேஷன் த ட்ரைனிங் சென்டர்ஸ் த ரெசிடென்ஷியல் போலீஸ் ஹவுசிங் ஃபெசிலிட்டிஸ் ஃபார் த போலீஸ் பர்சனல் அண்ட் எக்யூப்பிங் போலீஸ் ஸ்டேஷன்ஸ் வித் ரெக்கார்ட் மொபிலிட்டி மாடர்ன் வெப்பனரி அண்ட் கம்யூனிகேஷன் சிஸ்டம்ஸ் அந்த the other side, அந்த the administrative front, many reforms are being made. This includes separation of investigation from law and order. Specialized wings for social and cyber crimes are initiated in various states. Then, the technological reforms are pushed, including modernization of control rooms, fast tracking crime and criminal tracking network and system, CCTNS, and pushing for national intelligence grid, NAT grid, and pushing for incorporation of new technology into policing. The fifth step is, here, the state governments are already having surrender and rehabilitation policy. The central government supplements the activities of the state government through security related expenditure, SRE scheme, especially made for left-wing extremism affected areas. Apart from this, the developmental activities including road connectivity and communications are already taking place. But these activities should be rapidly scaled up in this area to completely eradicate the problem of underdevelopment which often leads to extremism. So, these are the points that you have to remember about left-wing extremism. See, this is an important topic under internal security in General Studies Paper 3. So, please revise the points that we discussed. So, with these learned points, let us take up the next article. Look at this news article. Recently, the Supreme Court has refused to stop the release of Bihar's caste survey data. While the petitioners argued that the data was collected unlawfully, but the Supreme Court has rejected this argument. There were also concerns that compiling and publishing this information would violate the privacy of the individuals. But the court has also rejected these concerns. The court ordered the Bihar government to file a response on this matter. So, this is the news given here. In this context, let us see the benefits and challenges of a caste-based census in India. Now, we shall look at the advantages of the caste-based census. The first advantage is, it will address the social inequality in the country. See, caste-based discrimination is still prevalent in many parts of the country. So, conducting a caste-based census can assist in recognizing the disadvantaged communities and ensuring that they are given a priority in policy making. So, by understanding the distribution of different caste groups, targeted policies can be implemented. This will help in addressing the social inequality and uplifting the marginalized communities. Second important benefit is, it ensures equitable distribution of resources. So, without accurate data on the population of OBCs, and other caste groups, it is difficult to ensure the equitable distribution of resources. So, a caste census can help in this regard by providing an insights into socio-economic conditions and needs of the different caste groups. So, it can guide the policy makers in formulating the policies that cater to the specific requirement of each group. Thereby, it will ensure inclusive development. Third biggest advantage is, it will monitor the effectiveness of various affirmative actions of the government. Here, we should know that the affirmative actions means the policies like reservations for OBC and other groups which are primarily given to ensure social justice. However, without the proper data, it becomes very challenging to evaluate the impact and effectiveness of these affirmative policies. 
So, a cost-based census can help to monitor the implementation and outcomes of such policies and it will enable the policy makers to make an informed decision making. Fourthly, cost-based census will provide a comprehensive picture of Indian society. See, a cost census can provide a picture of the diversity of Indian society. It will shed some light on the social fabric and the various interplay between different cost groups. This data can contribute for a better understanding of the social dynamics of caste in our country. So, these are some of the benefits of the cost-based census. Now, looking at the other end of the spectrum, let us see some challenges regarding the cost-based census. The first important concern is the concern of stigmatization. Here, some people believe that cost census will further entrench the cost-based identities. This will stand as a block for an effective nation building because often caste-based identities might lead to infighting among our citizens. So, publicly available caste data could stigmatize the individuals and communities and it may also affect the social interactions and opportunities within them. And second important issue is regarding the misuse of caste data. The political parties might use the caste-based census to invoke their vote bank politics which may also lead to conflicts within the society. Thirdly, there may be inaccuracies in the caste-based census. So, determining the castes accurately can be difficult due to some phenomena like intercaste marriages, individuals identifying with multiple caste groups, etc. These may lead to potential inaccuracies in the survey. The last issue is regarding the administrative challenges. Government said that the caste census is complex and it is logically very difficult to conduct. So, here are some of the issues related to caste-based census as given by the author of this article. So, that's all about this news discussion and let us take up the next article. Look at this news article. The news is, yesterday, United Nations Human Rights Council, UNHRC, urged the Indian government to protect the family of Manipur-based human rights activist, Mr. Bablu Loitangbam. The UNHRC wrote on the X platform and urged the authorities to protect the Bablu's family. See, this is all about the news. Now, let us move on to news analysis part. Here, we are going to discuss some points regarding an important UN-based organization, which is United Nations Human Rights Council. Let us see some basic points about this organization. See, the UNHRC is an intergovernmental body that functions within the UN-based system. It was created by UNGA, United Nations General Assembly, on 2006. See, this body was created based on the UN resolution numbered 60 bar 251. Here, we also need to be aware that UNHRC replaced the erstwhile UN Commission on Human Rights. See, the headquarters of UNHRC is situated in Geneva, Switzerland. Now, having seen the basics about UNHRC, now let us see some of the roles which are performed by this organization. First of all, UNHRC is responsible for the promotion and protection of human rights around the globe. In addition to this, it also assess and address the human rights violations across the globe. The third most important function of the organization is to make recommendations to stop human rights violations because these recommendations are very vital for stopping the HR violations around the world. The another important function of UNHRC is deliberation function. See, UNHRC conducts discussions on all thematic based human rights issue and situations which requires continuous attention of the world. These are all some of the roles performed by this organization. Now, moving on to the membership of the organization, the UNHRC consists of 47 member states and they are being elected by United Nations General Assembly. Now, here we should note that the membership is not fixed in this organization. Here, once when a particular country got elected as a member, it will serve for a fixed term of three years. After that, a fresh election will be conducted to choose the members. So, to put it simply, that it is just like our Lok Sabha elections, where fresh elections will be held after the expiry of its term. Now, coming back to our discussion, note that a country is allowed to stand in the election for the second consecutive term in UNHRC. However, there is a catch. Here, the countries are not eligible for an immediate re-election after serving two consecutive terms. 
here there is a catch however the countries are allowed for re-election these countries are not eligible for immediate re-election after serving two consecutive terms here we should be aware of the fact that the 47 seats are not open to any one particular area the membership is distributed among different geographical regions to ensure a balanced and equitable representation so this allows UNHRC to obtain diverse view while discussing the human rights matter now look into the current scenario currently there are 13 seats for african states there are 13 seats for asia pacific states eight seats for latin america and caribbean states there are seven seats for western european and other states and six seats for eastern european states here we need to be aware of the fact that india is currently one of the members of unhrc so this is all about the membership of the organization that is all about the news analysis of unhrc now let us quickly revise what we studied about this organization in this analysis we first saw the basics of unhrc next we discussed about the roles of the unhrc finally we saw about the membership of the organization and the geographical distribution of the membership that's all about the news discussion with this let us move on to the next part of our analysis that is preliminary practice question discussion today we are having four questions let us solve them one by one see the first question consider the following statements regarding the money bill the statement one says that it can be introduced by any member of the Lok Sabha statement 2 prior permission of the president is required to introduce the bill statement 3 the recommendations of the Rajya Sabha are binding on the Lok Sabha here we know from our analysis discussion that the first statement is wrong because the money bill can be introduced only by the ministers seeing the second statement it is correct because prior recommendation of the president is mandatory for introducing the money bill seeing the third statement the recommendations of the Rajya Sabha are not binding on the Lok Sabha so by eliminating the option 1 and 3 we know that only the th second statement is correct so the correct option is option A only one see the second question consider the following statements regarding the monetary policy committee first statement says that it decides the RBI's benchmark interest rates see the first statement is correct the second statement is it is a 12 member body including the governor of RBI and it's reconstituted every year here the second statement is incorrect because from our discussion we know that the MPC is a six member body and the members of the monetary policy committee will be appointed for a period of four years and moreover the members are not eligible for the reappointment so the second statement is wrong third statement is it functions under the chairmanship of union finance minister see this statement is wrong because RBI governor is the chairman of MPC so here the first statement alone is correct and the statement 2 and 3 both are incorrect so the correct option is option A see the third question this is a previous year preliminary question appeared in the year of 2009 here consider the following statements the first statement is between the census 1951 and 2001 the density of the population of India has increased more than three times see the density in the year of 1951 is 117 persons per square kilometer and in 2001 it stands at 324 per square kilometer so on seeing this the density has only tripled and it has not increased more than three times so the statement one is wrong and the second statement is between census 1951 and 2001 the annual growth rate of the population of India has doubled we can see that the annual growth rate of population density in 1951 stands at 1.25 percentage and in 2001 it stands at 1.93 percentage so it has not doubled so this statement is also wrong so the both the statements are wrong and the correct option is option D see the last question of the day consider the following statements right to education right to equal access to public service right to food how many of the above are the human rights under universal declaration of human rights see from the commonsensical approach we can easily say that all the threes would have been mandatory under human rights so the correct option is option c and moreover the main question based on today's discussion is listed here so interested aspirants can write the answer and post it in the comment section if you like today's video like comment and share it with your friends 
for more updates regarding UPSC preparation subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy thank you for listening